103. It was Thursday night around, um, must have been around 9.30 that um, I pulled up with a large, large SEER bus, SEER coach, 50 passenger with these 12 students on them and dropped them off at Amanda and Andrews, a little worried that they were getting six boys at 9.30 at night and how were they going to handle six boys? The next morning I get a text from Amanda, oh, they're so precious, I love them all. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it really is a joy um, to minister to students and to care for students. Um, it, and it is hard work, but they've really, the students have done the hard work. Um, when you think about it, could you, at age 9, 10, 11, 12, most of these are 12, 13, 14, come over to a foreign country, uh, gone to China, and tried to learn everything in Chinese? Um, they're the ones who have courage, and they're the ones who are working hard. Um, so it's just our privilege to be able to help them in that process. If you're using a pew Bible, page 632. We're in Psalm 103. We had looked at this psalm a few weeks ago um, as, we, as we wrestled with the death of Joey. And we used Psalm 103. Um, verses 6 through 18, to try to bring some comfort to us. And we talked about seven truths. And Valerie, if you can just put all those seven truths up right now. The seven truths of God's heart towards us. Um, uh, he loves to help the needy. He shows mercy to those who don't deserve it. He tempers his wrath. He forgives all of our sins. Um, he understands our weaknesses. He understands that we are made from dust. We are frail. And he leads us to eternity by leading us, linking us to himself. And so I thought we would go back this morning and take a look at the first five verses of this psalm as well. Let me read those first five verses to you. Again, if you um, have a Bible, Psalm 103, verses 1 through 5. If you've got a pew Bible, 632. Verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all of your sins, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks that you are not an unknown God, that you are the God, the creator of heaven and earth, and you have made yourself known to us in the person of Jesus and in your written word. And so as we come to your written word, Father, help us in our understanding. Amen. A book came out a number of years ago. It was a bestseller on the New York Times list. It was titled The One Minute Manager. And the author was Ken, Ken Blanchard, and he was talking basically to business people, people in business, and how you motivate your workforce. And he developed a practice in helping his managers to motivate the workforce, and he talked about the one-minute praising. And he suggested to his managers, to employees, to catch someone doing something right and then praising them for one minute. We as parents sometimes try to do that. I know my parents, when I was growing up, sort of were old school. If you did something wrong, they merely scolded you. I know that we failed terribly oftentimes, but Dottie and I would attempt to catch our children doing something right and praise them for it with the hope that if you praise them for it, they would, the light bulb would go off in the head. That's what makes mom and dad happy. <laughs> this week I was reading in Numbers chapter 10 and 13, and it's the story of Israel. And Israel, even though God had done many things for them, he had rescued them out of Egypt, he had rescued them out of slavery, 
And yet, while he leads them into the desert, they begin to complain. God provides manna, and they don't think the manna's good enough. And they begin to desire that they were slaves again because the menu in Egypt was better than the menu in the wilderness. And so they were willing to exchange their freedom in the desert to going back to slavery as long as they could have what they wanted to have. And we are sometimes like them, and they sometimes are like us. And so sometimes in life, we need to give ourselves and we need to give God a one-minute praising. Psalm 103 is David giving himself a talking to. It's a prayer by David in which he talks to his own soul and reminds himself that in the midst of everything, he needs to give God one-minute praising. And so he says, forget not all of his benefits. And then I wonder if I were to ask all of you this morning to give God one minute of praising how you would do. We are very quick, and if I would say, can you talk to God for one minute and tell him all the things that you need, we would have no problem using up all 60 seconds telling God all the things that we need. But could we take up 60 seconds and tell God what a wonderful God he is and praise him? Some people consider this the greatest of all the Psalms. Spurgeon called it a Bible within itself. And he said there's so much in this Psalm, there's too much, he said, for a thousand pens, end of quote. Now David wrote this Psalm at the end of his life, and so he had much to think about because he had seen God's love and God's mercy in his life even when he had sinned grossly against God. And he begins us with a wholehearted, intentional praise of God. Let all that is within me bless his holy name. Forget not all of his benefits. And then he goes on and he lists five benefits that God has given to him. And so I just want to go over them quickly this morning with you. The first one is pardon. Notice that in the very first who forgives all of your iniquity. David begins by reminding us that God forgives all of our sins. It's not surprising because that's the foundation of Christianity. Our greatest problem is that we have guilt. We feel bad sometimes about the things that we do. And that guilt comes from God. He reminds us that we are sinners, that we're estranged from him and that our greatest need is forgiveness. And notice that David says that God forgives all of our iniquities. That's good news, because sometimes we blow it. We really, really mess up. We really hurt other people. We really do those things that hurt ourselves. We do those things that dishonor God. And yet God's aware of that, and God reminds us that he has forgiven all of our sins. When Christ died, think about it this way. When Christ died upon the cross, all of our sins were in the future. And when we come to Christ and we ask for forgiveness of our sins, it's just not the sins that we've committed that day or all the past sins but all of our sins, even those we are yet to commit. What a God we serve. What grace, what mercy. He forgives all of our sins, past, present, and future. All that he asks of us is that we would come to him and say, God, you are my father. And I admit, I've sinned against you. I've done those things that dishonor you. I ask you to forgive me. And then he reminds us, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He sent Jesus to die upon the cross to forgive your sins. Understanding that he forgives our sins is a wonderful insight into the nature of God. He's more willing to forgive than we sometimes are willing to forgive ourselves. 
He's eager to forgive. He's ready to forgive. And he wants to forgive you, even this morning. Secondly, he's a healing God. He's, the psalmist says, who heals all of your diseases. I don't know about you, but that benefit is close to my heart. I'm sure it's close to many of your heart because some of you have been ill. I know in my family, I've been ill with heart surgery. Dottie's mom has been ill, passed away. There has been illness in our family. And we understand from this verse, even though there is illness, God still extends our days and sometimes in his mercy and grace brings healing so that we live much longer than we ever thought we would live. If you, are, if you were sick and you're healthy today, give thanks to God. If you had cancer and your cancer is in remission, give thanks to the Lord. If you've had heart problems and they've done bypass surgery or given you a pacemaker, give thanks to the Lord. Because remember that any healing in this life comes from the Lord, but it's also temporary. Our ultimate healing comes when we are raised, immortal, and incorruptible. But now, between now and then, we give thanks to God. If you took an aspirin this morning because you had a headache and you no longer have a headache, give thanks to the Lord. If you took some ibuprofen this morning because your back hurt and your back no longer hurts as much, give thanks to the Lord. People say, do you believe in divine healing? That's the only kind of healing there is. It comes in a variety of ways. God sometimes uses doctors. God sometimes uses medicine. But the healing comes from God. Thirdly, deliverance. The psalmist says, who redeems your life from the pit. To redeem means to rescue from danger in a time of trouble. The pit refers to death. Now, this benefit might be a little hard to grasp. I was thinking of an analogy. Think about the thousands of miles that you and I drive. Perhaps you don't drive thousands, maybe you drive hundreds. I typically put three or 4,000 miles on my car every month. And every day I know that people are killed on the highway. And yet every day I come home to my family and I'm alive. If God willed it to be so, I would die in a car accident. God, in his great mercy, has protected me all the times that I've driven. Think about times you've driven, where you went to turn the knob on the radio station, as I did the other day, and I put my head down for one second, and Dottie would tell you, I almost hit a young man walking on the side of the road. For one second, I put my head hand to turn the radio knob and look down just to make sure my hand was reaching the knob. God protected that young man and he protected me. Every day the Lord rescues you, rescues you, you and I in a million ways and we don't see it. His angels are camped around you and I. His angels deliver us from trouble and yet when the time comes he will call us and we will go to him. But until then, we are immortal. Because the Lord and his angels encamp around us. Often we are flippant about God's protection. Someone asks you, well, what happened to you today? We sometimes say, oh, nothing happened to me. But think of what didn't happen to you. No one robbed you. Your arthritis didn't flare up. The truck didn't hit you as it hit the 84 people in Nice. No one scammed you. No one stole your identity. You don't have cancer. Or if you do, the Lord has extended your days. You've got your health. You've got your family. You've got your friends. You have a job. You have at least some income that's coming into you that you can put food on the table. Think of all the bad things that could have happened to you today that did not. The fact that nothing happened to you today means that God's doing his job. 
Sometimes people call this the doctrine of perpetual preservation. It means that while we're here on earth, with all of its dangers and troubles, God is constantly at work behind the scenes, working to protect us in the time of trouble, to clear the way ahead. Think about your children. Think about your grandchildren. Of all the times they almost got hurt significantly, I mean really significantly, and God protected them. Fourthly, coronation. The psalmist says, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The older translations say that he crowns us with loving kindness. Loving kindness is the loyal, unending, unchanging love of God towards us. Even though we sin against God, God never stops loving us. No matter how much you hate God or don't want anything to do with God, God continues to love you. And then he crowns us with tender mercies. Tender mercies means he knows what we are going through and he meets us right where we are. If we were to truly deserve to get what we deserve, we would stand no chance. But instead of justice, God gives us mercy. And the crown that's mentioned in this verse reminds us of our position as the children of God. In our culture, only kings and queens wear crowns. But in the family of God, the children wear crowns because he crowns us with his steadfast love and his mercy. Fifthly, the psalmist says, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed. The good of verse 5 comes from God, not from things that we see around us. One translation says, he fills my life with good things. But I don't want you to think that when you read that translation, those paraphrased versions, that, and it says, he fills my life with good things, that that somehow is a promise that God's going to give you every material possession that you ever wanted. The emphasis in this verse is not on what we possess, but on what possesses us. Eugene Peterson, in his paraphrased version, says, he wraps you in goodness. He wraps you with beauty eternal. He fills you up with himself so that you don't want all the things of this world. To be satisfied means to be filled up that you need nothing else. You think on Thanksgiving when we eat a big meal or other times you eat a big meal and your mother or your grandmother or somebody tells you, oh, have more, have more, and so you go around and have a second helping and there's still food on the table, so Dottie says, have more, have more. <laughs> and you say, I can't eat any, have more. <laughs> and you're filled up, and that sense of being filled up is a wonderful sensation. You were once hungry, and now you're full, and that's a wonderful sensation. But eight hours later, 10 hours, 12 hours later, that satisfaction wears off and you are hungry again. David is speaking of a satisfaction that never wears off, that's deeper than anything the world can offer. I remember following my Steelers back in the 70s, Terry Bradshaw. I remember... One of the rivalries during the early 70s with the Steelers were the Dallas Cowboys. And one of their star players was a guy named Dwayne Thomas, for those of you who are a little older. And Dwayne had good years and bad years, and, but he was entering the Super Bowl, and someone asked him what he thought about the ultimate game. And his answer sounded like it almost came from the book of Ecclesiastes. He says, if this is the ultimate game, why do we play it year after year? Why indeed? But it's that way with everything that the world has to offer. We are here today. The possessions that we have today are here today. We are gone tomorrow. Our possessions are gone. God says to his fading, frail, perishing children, I will fill you up so that you can soar like the eagles. 
All of us need that. I need that. We want to be filled up with a sense of, of purpose and fulfillment in our life. And the only way we can have that sense of purpose, fulfillment in our life, is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. He fills us with contentment. He fills us with satisfaction, with strength. And he does this by filling us with himself. And so when we come to this end of this magnificent succession of benefits, they form a perfect summary for anyone who wants to wake up your soul. If this morning you're feeling a little dis disconnected with God and you need to wake up your soul, then go home and meditate on this psalm. Forget not all of his benefits. We've been pardoned. God brings us healing. He delivers us. He crowns us with mercy and love. And he gives us satisfaction. My call to you this morning is let us join ranks of those who dwell on what they have. And we do not forget all that has been given to us. And so let us this morning wake up our souls and praise God. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks this morning for this wonderful reminder, for this talking to that David does to himself. Help us to practice that same talking to of reminding ourselves of how good you've been to us. You are a good, good Father. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.